soup, snacking peppers, squash bugs on there. Nasty thing in this one. Hello and welcome back to Sage and Stone Homestead. My name is Heather. I have done nothing in the garden this week. I take that back. I've done a little bit, but today, like just today, because we have had temperatures well over 100 degrees literally every day this past week. It was supposed to just be like a four day heat wave turn into a six day heat wave, and it completed with a torrential amount of rain in less than 12 hours. So the garden is both equally fried and drenched. It's a weird juxtaposition. It's basically dead. So I would like to know from you guys if you really wanna see any more garden tours after this one. I am gonna to try to get a fall and winter garden tour thing kind of set up, but when my fall and winter garden is actually planted right now, I haven't even started the seeds. I am a little bit late on that. But as I mentioned, I didn't do anything garden related this past week. It was just too hot. However, the garden did keep growing even though I wasn't really here to tend it. I've noticed we have got a lot of these loofah flowers and then my children actually noticed that we actually have some loofah. I think there's probably more than just these three loofah right here, but these three absolutely thrill me. I honestly didn't think we were gonna get any loofah this year. They're actually quite large, you can see. Obviously still green. I noticed that it looks like on the archway here that the loofah really has started to take over the birdhouse gourd. This here is a loofah leaf. You can see them here. They're a lot more pointed where the birdhouse gourd leaves are a lot more satiny and slightly rounded. Recently, I did really cut back on the birdhouse gourd. It was just taking over to a degree that was really just too much. The birdhouse gourds in here are huge and lovely. And basically we're just gonna dry them out. From what I hear, it's best to dry out loofah gourds just on the trellis. Um, if that's not possible, because maybe the vines die back too much and they get weak and brittle and I don't want them to come crashing down, we will be able to harvest these and kind of stack them on pallets and let them cure that way. I hear someone. Where are you? Hello, sweetie. Little new peppers coming on here. It's good to see. I actually did not bring a harvest basket with me this week after the intense heat that we had this past week. I saw that we were gonna get a day's full of rain. I just had to harvest yesterday. So I took a picture of what I harvested yesterday. There's a lot, it appears that there's a lot of cherry tomatoes there. There are, but there's also quite a few beans underneath those tomatoes. I talked about last week how we're not really seeing any hornworm damage on the tomatoes. And then I noticed some hornworm da damage on the tomatoes. There's a little bit up there too. I haven't noticed the hornworm, but it looks like it's pretty much just on this side of the plant. It might only be one because there's not a lot of damage, but you can take a black light at night and come shine the light on your plants and the hornworms glow. It's pretty crazy. I have a video on it and I'll link that at the end of this video. But yeah, I harvested a lot of the cherry tomatoes off of these plants yesterday, just so I could get ahead of them cracking due to the rain. I've harvested quite a few of these yellow wax beans. These guys volunteered here from last year. This particular bean variety was actually sent to me from a subscriber, Marianne. Her family grows these every year. It's kind of like a family heirloom to them. So this is super special to me. And some of these I'm leaving on here so that I can get more seed and save more seed from them. Stay out of my coffee, ma'am. Ooh, we're gonna have words, you and me. So we still have some tomatoes. I feel like maybe I should have brought my harvest basket because I kind of want to grab these, but they'll be okay. I noticed these on here yesterday. They really are diseased. I left these on. These will be pig food. We've had lots and lots of rain and then a week of heat and then more rain. It's just it's a lot of fluctuation that the garden does not like. We still have quite a few snacking peppers. I probably could harvest these today, but I don't plan on eating them in the next couple days, so 
I don't feel a real pressure to come get these guys. They are putting on another flush of blooms, as you can see. So there's many more peppers on the way. I've noticed with my pepper plants this year and in years past that their first flush of blooms yields a good amount of peppers, but then the second and third flush of blooms, if you have a long enough season, is even more peppers. They tend to put on more peppers as the season goes on, like more each flush. <laughs> These empty beds here is where I had our peaches and cream corn growing. And I do have some things, <laughs> sorry, but I tried to pet her, ended up smacking her. I do have some plant starts, some cool weather, like leafy things that I wanna place in this bed. The little plant starts are cute. I'll show you a picture here. They're about yay big. I want them to get a little bit bigger before I plant them out here. We are gonna see some temps in the low 90s. It's a little hot for those cool loving plants. And so I'm gonna keep them inside for now. It's a lovely, Lovely mess, huh? Over on this side, we have our sweet potato patch. I really need to come in here and kind of tidy this up. There's actually a metal bed in here. You can see that. The whole intention was to keep the greens really trimmed back this year. Obviously, I let it get away from me just a little bit, but the idea of trimming those greens back is so the plant can focus its energy on the sweet potato tubers, the roots, instead of all of this foliage. Now, this foliage is edible. It's okay raw, but it's even better sauteed. So I think the next time we go to trim these, I'm gonna be intentional about this and probably save some in the freezer. It is really good, a tiny bit bitter, but I bet you that will cook off real nice. There are quite a few ripe sugar rush peach peppers down in here. I'll probably come collect more of these in the next couple days or sometime this week. I already have some fermented hot sauce going and I'm taking a video of it. That video should be up this Friday. I have a feeling I'm going to be making, ew, that's something to talk about. This is actually the first little bit of potential blossom end rot that I have seen on these peppers. You see blossom end rot kind of more frequently in like tomatoes, but you can see it on peppers and a couple other plants. And really it's a sign that your plant isn't able to take up calcium. It's not necessarily that your soil is calcium deficient, but sometimes when you have irregularities with watering or maybe your soil isn't allowing the water to kind of stay in the bed long enough for the plant to really take up what it needs. It's not only gonna get not get enough water, but it also won't get enough nutrients. So proper soil composition is important because this is the only pepper in sight with this kind of issue. I'm inclined to believe that something else happened that damaged the bottom of this pepper, and this is probably not blossom end rot, but it's worth noting. I'm just gonna put it right in there. We can make it a couple different shapes. I see that. Oh, decisions, decisions. 30 minutes to assemble. Challenge accepted. <laughs> okay. As you can tell, the lane is dead. <laughs> All these plants are either dead or dying. It's kind of sad, but also it's kind of not surprising. The melons in here are all cracking. It looks like we do have a little spaghetti squash that wants to be harvested today. It's nice and yellow, we'll get that. We're also gonna come out, come back out with the wagon that Levi just walked away with and harvest some of these tromboncino, but first we're gonna see what he's doing. Six and a half by two. Do you think we can manage that right there? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, our directions are wet. I left this whole box outside, but everything seems to be okay. So recently we were sent this garden bed that I'm really excited about. I wanted to put something that I could grow kind of 
more things that really need to be planted a little bit closer together or at least can be planted closer together in order to get like the most out of the space. So for an example, I could put carrots here in the rows. We have holes burned in the weed fabric in here, just about every foot all throughout. And it's really not the best use of our space to only put one carrot every foot. You can plant carrots a lot closer together than that. I wanted a raised bed situation in here that I could grow more things over winter. I just want to know what these rods are for. I think uh, support this way so it doesn't collapse out yeah. on itself. Levi and I were actually in here earlier doing a little bit of cleanup. I did have a spaghetti squash plant in this corner here and it was actually pretty overgrown with weeds and stuff. Levi came in this corner and cleaned it out really well and so this is where I want to put that bed. I feel like the look of these beds are so iconic that it goes without saying, but this is a Vigo garden bed. And I love the look of these things and everybody else's garden. We finally have one. And this is actually three feet high, which I also really like. They come in different heights and I think this is the tallest one. And you can configure them in different ways to suit your space, which I think is really cool. So this is going to be quite the thing to fill. I am gonna do that on a different video. I'm going to use like a hugel culture type method to fill this bed. We've got lots of logs that are starting to break down. I've got lots of wood chips, lots of manure in the barn. I'm gonna try my best to fill this entire thing without spending a dime. We'll see if I can do that. I'm not quite sure that I can. But that's gonna be a video for another day. We really need to get these trombones, you know, squash off of here. The plants are starting to die back. The squash is heavy and I don't want them to fall and crack and break. Pretty good. It's probably three feet tall. Ooh. There's a nasty thing in this one. See that? There's a borer in here. So I'm gonna cut this one. Just for context, my neighbor's cattle, a couple of them just had babies recently and I think one of them lost sight of her calf. So she's calling for, I don't have it. Oh, she's looking at me. Where's your baby? I don't have it. I just have a bunch of goats. My neighbor did just go out into his field on his side by side. So I hope everything is okay. So back to the squash. I saw the bore in there. You can see the damage on this stem. I'm just gonna cut right below the damage, which is gonna make this stem really short. Oh, crud nuggets. Oh no, I cut the bore in half. That's gross. It got deeper than I thought. Oh man, that's unfortunate. Okay, didn't get into the fruit. What I'm gonna do is use this one right away. Otherwise, this is gonna mold really quickly with no stem at all. You can and will sometimes see squash vine borers boring straight into the fruit. We might have an example of that today. I hope not, but it's possible. managed to harvest probably one of the last armpit melons that we're going to be able to get off of our plants this year. <sighs> Smells so good. We've dehydrated a ton of these. This is a squash vine borer moth right here. It looks a lot like a wasp, but it's not. Really, she's probably done all the damage she's gonna do laid a whole bunch of eggs, but these plants are basically done anyway. So no biggie.
So we have this table inside the greenhouse that I absolutely love. It's got wiring on the face of it, and that's awesome for potting up plants. It allows the soil and water to just drain right through, but it's also awesome for being able to cure our squash and potatoes and things like that. It is a little bit humid in the greenhouse for curing, but it has worked well in the past for us. So what my goal is, is to get these squash to be as deep a color as they're going to be. And I'd really ideally like for the stems to turn brown. And when they're fully cured, we can bring them in the house. I mean, realistically, these guys would probably cure just fine inside of my house, but there's something about direct sun that really helps harden these rinds and help extend the shelf life. These Trombonsino squash really are just like a butternut in flavor. We love them. When we took out that sugar eddy, bush style sugar eddy out of the corner of the greenhouse, we did get a few little scraggler squash off of that plant. So those are up here too. I noticed a couple of round zucchini that I had missed for I don't know how long. They're definitely past their prime, but I can use these for seed. And then back over here, obviously this side of the greenhouse needs some work, but these squash plants are done. Look at all the squash bugs on there. Gross. Aw, bummer. Well, that's sad. Look at how pretty that is. A couple garden tours ago, I had posed the question, if you guys knew what these squash were that I was growing over there. There's a couple options. They could have been the bush style sugar eddy, this guy right here, or it could have been something like this round zucchini. This one right here, it kind of looks like a mix of both, which is a very interesting, don't know. Whatever they are, I don't plan to eat them or save the seed, because I'm not really sure what to expect out of them. Um, but they're pretty cool decorations for now. I mean, we are headed into fall. Oop. Gotta knock you out. I wanted to update you guys on this mystery tomato that we had volunteer through the weed fabric in here. This looks a lot like the Heatmaster tomatoes that we grew last year. That fruit is touching the ground, so hopefully we get it to ripeness. We may not, that's okay. We've still been harvesting a lot of black-eyed peas, even though the plants have absolutely seen better days. They are still <laughs> putting on flowers and new pea pods. Here's a purple hull variety over here. This one is not ripe, but same deal. Lots of flowers still. I have really enjoyed growing these purple hull peas and the black eye peas here in the greenhouse. Next season, I plan to actually grow these two varieties out on the lane. There is quite a bit of okra that I should probably take off today. These guys grow like crazy and they get overripe pretty easily. our little okra haul for the day. Woo, slippery. This one here is the Alabama red okra, and this one here is the Okinawa pink okra. Out of the two types, I really think I like this more smooth type variety. Now this one, this one is probably um, too, too far gone to really eat. They get very hard and kind of, kind of woody really easily. Okra does, it's not just that variety. This one is still okay. You can hear a little bit of crunching, but it does have quite a lot of give. You can really feel if it's something you'd wanna bite down on. See, this one is actually a lot more rubbery than this one, even though this one's bigger, but we can eat this one. I'm actually out of seeds for both of those varieties, so I am gonna be leaving some of the pods on the plant to dry out so that we can have more seed. So that's what I have for you guys today. Please let me know if you want to keep getting garden tours. Even though the garden is dying, we're having a little bit of an awkward transition between the spring and summer garden and then the fall and winter garden. Is that something you really wanna watch the transition of? Or do you just want me to resume the garden tours when I actually have substantial amounts of fall and winter things to show you? As I mentioned earlier in the video, I'm gonna link up here the video where we caught lots and lots of hornworms here in the greenhouse last year using a black light. Take note on that video how incredibly different everything looks in here. <laughs>